You see, Lawrence's Arabs, or at least the Arabs he talks about in The Seven Pillars, are really Lawrence's Arabs. I mean, I would hate to see Lawrence used as Henry Kissinger has used him to explain the Semitic or Arab mind. I don't think you can talk about the Arabs the way Lawrence did. I mean, there are many different kinds of Arabs. And Lawrence had a great weakness, I think, and that was to leap to all kinds of fancy generalizations. Now, if you take them as poetic generalizations, they're fine, but if, as Lawrence intended them often to be, you, you look at them as sort of political generalizations about people that you have to deal with, I think they're very dangerous. I think Lawrence was a racist. I mean, I think he, he really felt that the Arabs were all one thing, that they represented something fundamentally interesting, but sort of inferior to, to a white Englishman, which is what he was. So, I, you know, I, I don't hold that specially against him. I mean, most of his contemporaries felt the way he did. I, I'm quite sure he wasn't a racist. I don't think he could have achieved what he did living among a very proud and disciplined people and ever given the impression that he looked down on them. And I don't think he could have survived among Bedouin tribesmen and men of great dignity and scholarship, such as Sharif Hussain, the Grand Sharif of Mecca, Abdullah, the Emir Abdullah, the Emir Faisal. I think if Faisal had thought that Lawrence was patronizing him, he'd have thrown him out of the camp. I was sent to these Arabs as a stranger, unable to think their thoughts or subscribe their beliefs but charged by duty to lead them forward and to develop to the highest any movement of theirs profitable to England in her war. If I could not assume their character, I could at least conceal my own and pass among them without evident friction and unnoticed influence. A man who gives himself to be a possession of aliens leads a Yahoo life, having bartered his soul to a broodmaster. He is not of them. He may persuade himself of a mission batter and twist them into something which they, of their own accord, would not have been. He may imitate them so well that they spuriously imitate him back again. Then he is giving away his own environment, pretending to theirs, and pretenses are hollow, worthless things. Lawrence attended yet another peace conference at Cairo in 1921. He went as advisor to Churchill, then colonial secretary. There, a new settlement was worked out, which gave some measure of sovereignty to the Arabs. I think Churchill regarded him as his principal advisor, and I have no doubt that a great deal of what came out of that conference, whether it was for good or for bad, was due to Lawrence's influence on Churchill. It could be right to say that he made some awful blunders, the settlement, as he called it, and ended up, I think, by saying that now he could rest on his laurels and, and um, the Arabs had got what, you know, what they ought to have had. Well, of course, they hadn't. They'd got a British mandate in, in, in Palestine, a British mandate in Iraq, and a British mandate in Transjordan, and a French mandate in Syria and Lebanon. Well, it wasn't what they went to war for. This, this idea that you should create little states, each of which representing, uh, represents a, a, a particular clan or religion or interest, has, I think, done more harm uh, than good. And I think much of, the, um, much of the unrest in the region since World War II is a direct reflection of that. That is to say, I think that the states that, that, that Lawrence and others created out of the large, undifferentiated mass of the southern Ottoman Empire um, have really uh, have really failed. I mean, all of these uh, states are really uh, map creations. And if you look at Lebanon today, if you look at what's happening in uh, Palestine, Israel, uh, the problems of Syria, the problems of Jordan, you're really you're really seeing um, the results of a vision of the world more or less crumbling. I must put on record my conviction that England is out of the Arab affair with clean hands. I was happy to withdraw from a political milieu which had never been congenial. Withdrawal was something of an understatement. This next photograph of Lawrence of Arabia, war hero, diplomat and scholar, shows him in 1922 as ordinary aircraftsman 
John Hume Ross. I have done with politics, I have done with the Orient, and I have done with intellectuality. Oh, Lord, I am so tired. I want so much to lie down and sleep and die. Die is best because there's no real value. He changed his name, reduced himself to the ranks, and joined the RAF. He was determined to shake off the nightmare that Lawrence of Arabia had become. At first, the disguise seemed perfect. Certainly, his hut orderly, Jock Chambers, had no idea who he was. I felt somehow that I ought to be tough with you. I don't know why. And I said, now, don't forget, I'm hut orderly here. And when you scrub that bed, short ass, you see you do it properly, no tide marks. He said, oh, all right. And he scrubbed it twice before I was satisfied. But the anonymity of the ranks didn't fool Fleet Street for long. I uh, was on guard with him when the, the Daily Express man came along, and the Times man. In fact, it was the Times man who said to Lawrence, who was actually standing on guard. He said, can I go in and see this bloke, Lawrence? So Lawrence said, no, I'm here to stop you. And he just casually said to him, you don't have to be in, do you? And he said, no, do I look like a soldier? That was all to it. This boat walked away. I've now been sacked from the RAF as a person with altogether too large a publicity factor for the ranks. But the ranks was where he wanted to be. In desperation, he changed his name again to Thomas Edward Shaw and enlisted as a private in the army. He was posted to the tank corps at Bovington Camp in Dorset. I didn't know who he was but I was parked almost opposite him in the hut. After a day or two, I found out who he was and why he was in the army. He told me he transferred from the Air Force. And uh, he said, you probably wonder why the name Shaw, when it was Ross in the Air Force. They asked me what name I wanted to go under. I opened a telephone book, jabbed my finger on it, said that one, and it happened to be Shaw. There was no connection with GBS. It just happened. Here every man has joined because he was down and out. We're all here unavoidably, in a last resort, and we assume this world's failures in one another. We are social bedrock, and each of us values the rest as cheap as he knows himself to be. We're all guilty alike, you know. You wouldn't exist, I wouldn't exist without this carnality. Everything with flesh in its mixture is the achievement of a moment when the lusty thought of Hut 12 has passed to action and conceived. And isn't it true that the fault of birth rests somewhat on the child? I believe it's we who led our parents on to bear us, and it's our unborn children who make our flesh itch. A filthy business, all of it. We did explain to me almost in detail why. With the Arab revolt, he'd been told to promise certain things to the Arabs. And he felt so let down with making these promises. He didn't want to make any decisions or promises on behalf of the government or anyone. He didn't want any authority at all. So he came down to the lowest possible wrong. That was his explanation. I admired him for that, of course. I realised he could have really gone to great places, but he was so disillusioned. I consumed the day and myself brooding, galloping mentally down 20 divergent roads at once, as apart and alone as in Barton Street in my attic. When my mood gets too hot and I find myself wandering beyond control, I pull out my motorbike and hurl it top speed through these unfit roads for hour after hour. My nerves are jaded and gone near dead, so that nothing less than hours of voluntary danger will prick them into life, and the life they reach then is a melancholy joy at risking something worth exactly two and ninepence a day. Um, I suppose in a way he was a loner, and I was a loner, we gravitated. Could be that, or we just got on easily with each other. But... We didn't mix with any of the others. Well, there was an odd one occasionally, but we were together most of the time. And then eventually took on that cottage. The cottage is alone in a dip in the moor. Very quiet, very lonely, very bare. 
a mile from camp. Furnished with a bed, a bicycle, three chairs, a hundred books, a gramophone and a table. Many windows, oak trees, rhododendron, laurels, heather. Dorsetshire to look at. I don't sleep here, but come out 4.30pm till 9pm nearly every evening and read or write or read by the fire. And all the good music. Not, uh, the sort of chamber music that I can't stick, but it was all good. He knew music. We used to go to the proms at times to listen. Dear Sir Edward, this is from my cottage, and we've just been playing your second symphony. Three of us, a sailor, a tank corps soldier, and myself. We agreed that you must be written to, and told that this symphony gets further under our skins than anything else in the record library of Clouds Hill. We have the violin concerto too, so that says quite a lot. Generally, we play the symphony last of all, towards the middle of the night, because nothing comes off very well after it. One seems to stop there. In Dorset, he continued to develop close friendships with Thomas Hardy, who was a near neighbor, with Lady Astor, the politician and socialite, and with another distinguished novelist who was a frequent guest at Clouds Hill, E.M. Forster. I liked the place at once. His friends were friendly to me. I felt easy. And to feel easy was, in T.E.'s eyes, a great recommendation. We went to care as soon as we were inside the place. We were to feel easy. We weren't to worry about the world and the standards which the world imposes. And here we taught and played Beethoven's symphonies to one another from the gramophone and ate and drank. We drank water only, or tea. No alcohol ever entered Clouds Hill. And we ate, this sounds less romantic, we ate out of tins. T.E. always laid in a stock of tinned dainties for his guests. There were no fixed hours for meals, no tablecloth, and no one sat down. If you felt hungry, you opened a tin and drifted about with it. Shortly after we joined, he was a keen swimmer, and I was as well. <clears throat> we went down to Irish Mill as a tiny little bay by Longworth Cove across the ranges. And we stripped off for swimming, and I looked at his back, and it was covered with scars. I said, you look as if you've been beaten up. There was a pause, and he said, well, I have, I'll tell you about it later. After swimming, we were just sitting there talking, and he told me about when he was captured by the Turks, and they whipped him. And then he showed me a scar on his tummy, where they'd held the skin out and pushed the bayonet through and twisted it. He said, oh, I've told you, but I'll tell you more in detail some other time. A lot of people say he wasn't beaten up, but I saw the scars. They were bad. <laughs> 